Hi, welcome to our second program of the She Opened the Door Ask the Expert series, season two. I'm Kate Pope, a 2013 graduate of SPS and co-chair of the She Opened the Door committee. The She Opened the Door Ask the Expert series features Columbia alumni speaking about their experiences, challenges, and achievements in an interactive setting with audiences from across the globe. I'm now pleased to introduce our speaker, Lavinia Nepal. Lavinia is a Columbia University alum, 21 SPS, and current founder and president of the Boomer M. Near the end of today's program, we'll have an audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We'll try to get to as many of these as we can. Welcome, Lavinia. It's such a pleasure to have you here with us and the She Open the Door community today. It's going to be an exciting chat and delving into your journey into innovative solutions for social change. First, let's start off with some of your early influences um, and your prior experience to coming to Columbia. So if you would kind of walk us through your undergraduate years, which you spent in India, did you already know during this time that you wanted to work in the technology space? And how did this kind of help you start to develop your career path? Of course, thank you so much, Kate, and welcome everybody. So really when I talk about technology, it was something I was always passionate about. I was pursuing computer science engineering during my undergrad, and I would work on projects related to smart cities, prosthetic arm, and I was really working on you know, making some of these applications. At that time, what really brought me joy was, oh, how technology can bring you know, so much convenience to your life. And it really brought so much joy to me because I would be able to relish the benefits of technology. I was really living on the other end where you do all the work and you can see how it you know, comes to life. And over the years, what I realized uh, after I came to Columbia was really to explore are these benefits just limited to a section of a population or is everybody enjoying it? So while I've always enjoyed technology and I knew I wanted to work in a space where I wanted to really focus on solving a real life situation, it has been really hard for me to see how this kind of translates to different people and audiences. So that time really influenced me to explore my core technical skills, focus on what power it brings when you work on a field like engineering that teaches you things like problem solving, critical thinking, which are kind of like key skills as you pursue different careers. So even if you're doing engineering, I don't think people always want to go and do a back-end job. I get inspired to go and try some other fields. So it definitely helped me understand what really brought joy to me. And then you transitioned um, over to the UN as a management and program analyst. Can you explain a little bit more about this position and then what led you to ultimately apply to the Applied Analytics Master's Program at Columbia? Absolutely. And I think when you think of you know, working at United Nations, most people would think about diplomacy, international relations, or human rights kind of career choices. And while I've been so passionate about technology, I've always enjoyed the international organization space. And my you know, passion for Model UN really inspired me to really find an opportunity where I could combine my passion for technology and my love for you know, international organizations. So at UN, I was working for the Office of the Undersecretary General on a very special global service delivery model project. We were really trying to transform how 193 different offices would do admin tasks. And is there a way to kind of set up global shared service centers to really amplify and make them more efficient? And we came up with a 64 million annual you know, savings project for them. So I was really heavily involved in research and data analytics. That's when I really discovered that it's not just technology, but my love for data that brings so much joy to me. I was able to kind of, you know, it's, it's like a puzzle was unfolding for me. I didn't know then. At that point, I was just excited to be able to try. And data analytics was, you know, one of those hard career choices at that point where everybody was talking about it. And, you know, all the engineers wanted to pursue a back-end data science job. But most people would, you know, think of companies like, oh, should I go work for Amazon, Google? And I wanted to see, you know, what about these international organizations? Is there an opportunity for me to explore a data analytics kind of opportunity at such an organization? And I'm so glad I kind of took that leap because it really changed my life. Now, when I think about it, I really didn't know what I was going into because people give you all kinds of advices. And I feel like, you know, some of those destiny moments happen when you just find the courage to go after some of those choices. I think that's really exciting that you applied. Now that you are a recent graduate of the program, is there anything looking back 
that maybe you would have studied a little bit different um, for the data analytics and digital technology field? No, I think I, I love data analytics so much that I would still go back and would pursue the same course. I think the program is fantastic. I studied applied analytics. It was a very hands-on course. They allowed us to try a lot of different you know, core technical kind of classes, as well as combine it with the management, storytelling with data, and a lot of those other innovative kind of opportunities for us to be able to practice, you know, because analytics, I think in today's time is at the heart of every industry. You know, whether you're in healthcare, whether you're in a public sector, no matter what field you're a part of, analytics is going to be there. It really depends on each individual, how we're embracing it, right? You could either be the ones that's, you know, either involved with it, really seeing how those insights are making those changes, or you could be on the back end and you still have to see the impact it's going to make. So I wouldn't want to change anything, I think, in terms of my experience at Columbia, but I definitely feel like that program helped me discover so many of my own kind of personal skills and also to be able to apply that to so many different industries. So I definitely highly recommend anybody to just even take a course in applied analytics, even if it's like a digital certificate course, because it's so important at the core of so many industries. I think that's great advice for everyone listening today. Now, switching sides, is there a skill or set of qualities that you think have been essential for you to impact in this field, whether that's from your undergraduate background or from your recent graduate background? So I think in terms of skills, I would say problem solving comes really high up if you are trying to kind of, you know, I think problem solving is a skill you need day to day basis, whether you're trying to deal with a personal situation or a professional situation. The next kind of key skill that I would really focus on a lot and encourage a lot of people because I feel like sometimes people feel you need to have all the skills, but skills oftentimes can be learned. And I think problem begins when people feel like, oh, I need to know and be an expert in it right from the start. But I highly encourage people to really look into program management. I think that really helps you be organized and pursue lots of different choices in a very effective manner. And I think agility was one other kind of skill that I feel that's super important when you're exploring this. And in terms of qualities, I feel like courage, I think you should find the courage to be able to make some of these decisions. You could be great at something, but if, unless you find the courage, you won't make that kind of decision. Uh, persistence, I think sometimes it takes patience and persistence go together for me. Sometimes you just have to be patient. It may not be the right time, but if you keep kind of building those core skills, meeting the right people, you really don't know what you're, you know, what opportunities lie ahead for you if you don't kind of take that courage step and make those choices. Well, speaking of courageous steps, you have started the Boomer M, a public charity, and we are going to deep dive into kind of all the specifics about how that happened. But I first wanted to go ahead and um, talk about, uh, you know, what is digital divide? What is digital literacy? Kind of have a little bit of background about those key topics before we start into how that inspired you to create your own charity. Absolutely. So digital divide, when you think about it, you know, it must come as no surprise that in today's time, for anybody to be able to enjoy technology, you need two things. You need to have access to internet and you need to be able to use a gadget that you might own. And for the large part of our population, if you think about it, a lot of individuals, communities are left behind. They do not have access to the kind of digital world we talk about, the convenience. Think about it. We're on the Zoom call today because of technology. But what about the people that are left behind? And digital divide oftentimes leads to social isolation, loneliness, a sense of helplessness. So many people, you know, suffer from anxiety and depression in today's time. And it really impacts their mental and emotional health when they don't have access to the kind of digital world we talk about. And digital literacy really talks about bringing those opportunities to those communities. How do we bridge, you know, this gap that exists this, where technology at that point is a bridge, not a barrier, where it's not stopping people from living their full potential in today's time. And so how did all of this inspire you to create the Boomer M for social change? Absolutely. And this really comes down from my time at Columbia when I was so excited to make all of these apps. And, you know, every time we'd be actually in a class and they would tell us, okay, if you really want to build an app in today's time, what would it be? right? What problem do you think your app would solve? And I spent a whole lot of week thinking, do we really need more apps or do we need apps to start being really useful and effective for everybody? Because, you know, when I said I was so excited about, you know, making 
all of these ads, oftentimes my own grandparents and parents would say, well, this looks great. You've done a good job, but we don't think this world is for us. And, you know, this was also peak of COVID when I was doing my program where the problem kind of exacerbated, right? Everybody would realize it, it, it no longer is a choice. It's almost a need for you to be able to access healthcare appointments, for you to be able to connect with your loved ones. And that's when I started doing research as, you know, is it just my grandparents and parents or is it a whole lot of other people that are being left behind? What is stopping people from really experiencing, you know, the potential of technology and the benefits it brings? And they're not alone, right? So you think about somebody that is 87 living all by themselves alone in an apartment, you're struggling. And it's really rooted in kind of like three main problems. The first one, there's a lack of necessary skills. Even if they wanted to be able to try and use some of these features, they're struggling with how to do it. Second, there's a problem of fear of judgment. So many times people feel the pressure to say yes to anything you hear about technology. We don't kind of give people the space to be able to say, well, I don't know something. If you ask somebody the same question in a different language, do you speak French, do you speak German? They're okay saying, I don't know the language. But the same question when asked about technology, people feel the pressure and that fear of judgment stops, makes people so hesitant to try so many things. And the third factor is financial constraints that is stopping so many of these communities to be able to enjoy. And that's when at Boomer M, EM really stands for empowerment. And our goal was, let's look at all of these different, you know, three major concerns and really solve it in a holistic way where we're not a tech support that, you know, we're in a black box situation, your problem is solved one time. But how do we empower, you know, older adults and people with disabilities to be able to be a part of this technological world and enjoy it? So we really focus on community empowerment, capacity building and education, where we give them the tools to be able to explore this journey. And really, it's, you know, we have a tech distribution program to help people from low income backgrounds to be able to get access to these products. We have shared gadget device programs where we have all of these senior centers where people can come in and try technology in a safe space where they can ask these questions and not feel judged. So really at Boomer M, you know, what brought so much joy to me was to see how it's changing lives of so many people. I, I really didn't know how, how, how big a difference it would make until I saw people. Uh, we've seen people tear up. We've seen people come back to us and share how they feel. Well, I can go back to the dinner table and not feel like I'm being judged. I can actually ask questions. They're calling their friends and they're telling people that they want to be a part of you know today's technological world and not be afraid. This is great to hear because I, I know that this is such an important aspect of today's society and struggles that people are having. Can you quickly describe um, the mission of Boomerang? I know you touched on it a little bit in the prior question, um, but one more time. Yes, absolutely. And you know, our mission at Boomerang is to bridge this global digital divide to empower older adults and people with disabilities to have a more connected and inclusive digital social experience through capacity building and education. We really focus on community empowerment or intergenerational learning program where we fully understand that people have kind of like different technology readiness, openness and learning styles. And we wanna be able to not only honor that people come in from different kinds of spaces where somebody wants to learn just the basics, right? Can I send an email? Can I effectively join a meeting? Can I download an appointment? To some people that are looking for more advanced things with technology, right? What is AI? Can I be a part of chat GPT world? Can I go explore artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and really try some of those you know, new higher end gadgets and apps that are being developed? And that's all okay. And I think giving people that space to be able to learn and feel comfortable with technology is our biggest mission at Boomer M. We don't want anybody to feel like you have to know it all or, you know, to be able to give them that space where they feel inspired, empowered, and, and a place where they feel like, you know, it's bringing them joy. Now, starting a public charity is a task in of itself. Um, I think it'll be really helpful for everyone today to hear some early challenges that you faced in creating this. But then on the reverse side, where did the Boomer M have some quick successes that you guys picked up right at the beginning? Right, and I often say this, you know, when you hear the word, you know, either whether you want to start a social venture or a charity, I think most people feel like it's a microwavable miracle where, okay, today you decide and tomorrow that's it. You know, it's like instant noodles is going to be ready. We're going to be <laughs> have all the success. 
Uh, I think if you give yourself the patience and, you know, take a step back and feel like it's going to be a process, you allow yourself to be able to explore this opportunity. So at Boomer M, how we really started was, of course, it came off as a research model where we tried to survey people. So really, if you're looking to start a public charity today, I highly encourage you to think about, in its simplest form, how you can test and get some feedback from the people you want to serve. So think of it as if you wanted to open a cake store today, you really don't have to go try all 50 flavors of cakes. Think of, you know, can you master a cupcake? Can you think of one vanilla flavor that you would want to test out first? Once you, you know, kind of get feedback, hear from what your audience says, you can then kind of scale up from there. So for at Boomer M, we really tested out our model by saying, okay, let's have a few sessions. Think of us as a pop-up that we would want to do uh, at a location to see are people really enjoying the kind of research work we've developed? What's, what are, you know, some of those gaps? And it really came out of a very holistic model where we then went back and kind of consulted people as to people who are experts in the field and said, but why is there a gap? You have a, an amazing senior center, you have a technology lab, why is it empty? Why, why is nobody walking in the door? We know there, that every day 10,000 people are turning 65. So by 2030, we did a lot of research and we knew that we're looking at 1.5 billion people in this age group. But really taking that research and then going and implementing those pilot projects was kind of the heart of how Boomer grew. And I think from the, I think the hardest was kind of looking for the first seed grant. Yeah. Once I think you 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 get there, it's it's a lot easy because I feel like it's the chicken and egg story, right? People want to see the impact, and then you really kind of need the resources to make that impact. So the more you can simplify your you know vanilla cupcake, it will be easier for you to execute it. And once you start to kind of develop testimonials and feedback, the process became a lot easier for us. We soft launched into communities that already had those large groups where we were willing to do kind of you know collaborations. And then from those pilot projects, it was scaling up, you know, finding the next big opportunity. And I think partnership building is a really important skill if you're looking to build a charity or a social venture. You really need to be able to be able to collaborate with different organizations, really find the resources where a lot of burden can be shared. Because once you start sharing that space, you will see how magic will begin to happen. And then you know, being patient. I don't think it happened overnight. We have, if you see any success in Boomer M, I 100% give credit to the board. I give credit to all of the volunteers and all of the people that we actually went and kind of pitched ourselves to. Because even if they didn't say yes instantly, sometimes they would give us critical feedback. And creating kind of like a loop where we were learning, where we started taking feedback as, okay, this is the hidden gem that we've been looking for. If we can solve this problem, the next time we go and pitch to a different organization, we'll actually be ready to be able to do it. So anybody looking to start, I think be prepared that it's going to be a process, but once you kind of break down complex kind of problems into simpler steps, find mentors and advisors who are involved in this space, it becomes a whole lot easy. And and then it's, it gets easier. It gets better. You know, you hear that often, but I, <laughs> I just want to say that it's it's true. It gets better. It's not it's not all fancy, but it gets better. And the days you'll actually see people come in and enjoy the work you've done, those are the days you'll be smiling. Those are the days that keep you going, you know, when things don't work out, you're like, but they're waiting for us. They want us to go back. Anna's waiting for us. You know, Naomi's counting on us. It's all of those days, you know, that the people are waiting for you to come back with more resources. That's what keeps you kind of inspired. And I feel like I'm so grateful also for my family. They're the ones, you know, your closed network. I feel like you will need your closed network to be able to be your biggest cheerleaders. And I know it's not just my sacrifice, it's their sacrifice. The days I'm, you know, still figuring things out, they're there to cheer you. And I've been so fortunate with all the mentors I found and advisors. So definitely it's going to be a journey. It's going to be a process. But if you're looking to start, I think I highly encourage you to start to test out some of these cupcakes and the audience you want to serve. Um, do simpler things. I, I always say, you know, you don't have to go full blown and launch it overnight, but try it out in simpler formats, a pop-up, you know, a workshop, one online kind of virtual session. And then if anybody has any other kind of assistance in doing the paperwork, I'm always there to assist because I know I couldn't find a lot of these resources. <laughs> When I was researching, I was like, how do people do this? And I was like, that's how people are unable to do it because it's so complicated. It's just buried in like a whole lot of paperwork, but it's actually easy. Once somebody's done it, you can reach out. So feel free to reach out. I can help you out. It's, it's not as hard as it seems. And there's going to be so much joy once you start to see, uh, you know, when, when your project comes to life, that's the day you see, you know, all the hard work has been so worth it. 
every person. And at that point, it's not just your hard work. It's everybody else's hard work, right? People who have been patient with you while you're dealing with this. People who have given you this. You know, sometimes I know it, it's like somebody, you know, we're here at She Opened the Door series. It's literally when somebody opens that door for you. It's literally at that point you come into those life-changing opportunities. And I know for Boomer M, that happened, you know, when somebody kind of introduced us to another network, they're like, loved it so much. Why don't you go also, you know, showcase at a different location? And then, you know, we scaled from New York to Michigan and that's how we're growing. And to me, that has brought so much joy that I look back, I'm like, I don't even think I could have planned it all out in this way, even if I wanted to. Uh, but I'm so grateful that it worked out. It's really great that you've kind of pulled back the curtain for us today and we get to see the ins and outs and the little details that it's not an overnight success for everybody. It takes a lot of hard work. Um, and I love the cupcake theory of testing it out, starting small, doing a lot of behind the scenes research. I think that is great for advice for everyone today. And thank you for helping the future projects um, that might come out of this. One of the unique aspects that we've talked about about Boomer M is that it offers programs really tailored to individuals with varying levels of readiness, openness, digital mastery. Can you explain a little bit more about the signature learning model and how this works for participants, kind of really how Boomer M works on the day to day? Yes, absolutely. So this was something that we really realized early on in our research, that there are a couple of different factors stopping people. And the problem begins when you try to kind of group everybody into the same kind of room and expect them to function and respond equally. Think about it for a minute when we wanted to, you know, when we applied at Columbia, there's so much back end work that's done to ensure that every kind of student that gets selected is put into the right classroom where you're going to be in the right mix. But when you think about technology, that's not really happening. Everybody's put in the same room, you're in different age groups. So it's not really age that needed to be, you know, the primary criteria to group people, but it was their openness and readiness, right? What is it that would make things easy for them? So the way our model works is we're able to kind of have different kind of options for people to pursue technology learning. When we do these pop-ups, we try to do a combination of events. There could be some basic level events, which you really focus on kind of like the essential services you need. How do you, how do you get to your next appointment? How do you join a Zoom meeting? How do you call and connect with a loved one? And then you have some more advanced kind of workshops, which really focus on going into what is virtual reality. If there's a startup that's launching a new technology and you're curious about it, you know, we'd love to do kind of like a collaboration and then bring them into this space where you could try some of those features in. The goal is to really give people that kind of, you know, room to be able to pick what feels comfortable for them. Then also when we talk about the modes of learning, right? There's so many different ways in which you could learn. We have a way in which we have some in-person workshops like the pop-ups that we'll be doing. So, you know, we could be in New York City at a senior center where you could come join in or it could be a location that we're converted into a, like a little space for Boomer M where you could come in and experience. And we do a lot of these virtual sessions as well as sending people short tutorial videos to learn at your own pace. We want to give people the opportunity to be able to learn in their own language. So, you know, it's available in, we use AI to kind of use some animated characters and have this information be available to you at a pace that's most comfortable. Anything that could potentially become a barrier, we want to lift that off and give you the space to be able to find that journey. And to really customize it and tailor it for our audience, we often spend time in doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultations. We feel that's a key step before getting people you know, into these workshops, really helping them understand where they are and what combination could work for them. And when we work with organizations, we're able to really do kind of like pre-surveys of the topics they're most interested in, really tailor the curriculum for them. For instance, when we're doing work with disability organizations, our course is you know, tailored very differently from the work we would want to do with a senior center. Versus when we're doing a virtual session where we could kind of open the door to audience that's a little bit more comfortable looking to kind of explore, also connect with other kind of groups. And oftentimes we also collaborate with other organizations, like we just hosted a tech wellness program where we were able to kind of bring two aspects of it, you know, intro to AI where you can unlock your potential exploring some of these things. And then, you know, this was followed by a very special movement speak kind of like dance workshop where we partnered with an organization that hosts some of these sessions for order addicts. So we really, you know, kind of gave them the opportunity to try those two worlds together, uplift their spirits where they don't feel the pressure to know all of those things. So 
we really tailor it around them versus, you know, saying, oh, we have a fixed curriculum, a fixed course, and you're forced to then be a part of it and then be like, I don't know if it's for me or not. I think that's great. And it's also great to hear some positive aspects of AI being used. I think we hear so many things about AI right now in the generations that um, it's nice to hear that you guys are using that to really help broaden languages and learning aspects. I think that's a great component. Digital technology and literacy, super high focus right now with people. Where do you kind of see the future of Boomer M in the next three to five years? Where do you see taking it and maybe what might change or be different? So I think in the next three to five years, we're really looking to scale, scale in terms of our offerings, add more locations. And we're right now focused in New York City and Michigan. We want to start to add more centers, start to add more states and cities and, you know, potentially open the door to as many older adults and people with disabilities as possible. We also kind of want to be innovative in terms of we have an intergenerational learning program where we're able to pair, you know, volunteers who are typically youth volunteers that are either interested in helping us take our mission to the next level or interested in pursuing technology careers or just curious about, is it possible for me to give back some of my time and experience what it would feel like? to be able to develop the next generation of technology that I'm interested in developing. We kind of pair them with um, our participants and give them the opportunity to not just learn from each other, but also to find that space to ask those questions as you're learning. And I think that has brought so much joy that we wanna kind of take that into a digital mode going forward. A lot of our volunteer opportunities are available globally. So I know I have somebody you know, volunteering from San Francisco, from Ghana, from Asia, and, we want to kind of open that door in the next three to five years to as many more individuals, both youth as well as you know older participants, to be able to enjoy this. We want to take our cupcake sales to you know now the cake factory mode. Uh, that's really the goal because we're testing out so many of these cupcakes and we're seeing so much, you know, such heartwarming feedback that we're now looking to scale up, give people more flavors, give them the opportunity to be able to enjoy this. And in the next three to five years, we want to be not just you know tech advocates, but really open that door to any technology that's being developed for people to be able to experience it in, in a safer environment, to be able to know that as a community, we can keep each other safe, right? And a lot of our workshops oftentimes have staying safe online as a component to it, where that's like a mandated, you know, like it's mandatory for kind of giving so much information as to how to use, how you can stay safe, right? And think of it as, you know, how you would do for your own family members. If you can think of one person in your life right now, that would benefit from this information. Remember how we would stretch ourselves. I know I would do that for my parents any day. I would do that for my grandparents any day. Anybody I know in my network, I would want to do that. We want Boomer M to be that, you know, that family member that's doing it for them. Somebody that doesn't have a person to call, we want to be the person they're calling to get that help, to feel like it's a safe space for me to be able to try things. Well, we wish the Boomer M lots of future success. Um, I think this is a great um, organization that you have started. And you're also involved in outside charities. Um, going back to being from India um, and you moved to the US after college, can you share your current involvement with the Princess Daya Kumari Foundation Society for us? Yes, absolutely. I feel like, um, so this is a very special society that's established in Rajasthan in Jaipur, which is my hometown where I come from and my school you know, my, the founder of the school that I went to was the first all-girls school that was established even before India got its independence. And she was the visionary who realized, and, you know, my grandmother used to often say this, when you educate a man, you're educating one person. But when you educate a girl, you're educating a family. You're going to be able to give them the tools and resources they need as a family to flourish. And this foundation is really close to my heart because it allows underprivileged girls and women to receive education. The movement is called Beti Bachao and Beti Parhao, which means save the girl child and educate her to be able to give her the resources and the training that's needed to be able to build a career and livelihood for her and for her family. And I think that is so, so close to my heart, not just because my I was so fortunate that my parents have, you know, they've gone above and beyond to educate me. They've been so supportive of my kind of career choices. But I, I sincerely hope that people that lack those resources find those resources, especially women, because I don't know what my life would be if I hadn't received this education. Would I be here? Would I be sharing all these stories? Probably not. So I, I, it's so close to my heart to be able to 
go back and think that how many people would how different their lives can be once they receive kind of like the first step of receiving that education, receiving that training. So this foundation is very close to my heart that gives that those opportunities for underprivileged women in India. And I, I genuinely hope that in our lives, anything that has benefited ourselves, you know, where we've seen some change, some positive impact, for us to be able to go back and be like, can I do that for somebody else? Can I go back and give that to somebody else? If it's in my power, you know, in terms of time, energy, resources, anything that you can, I would want to be able to wake up and be like, you have me. I'm going to be there. I'm going to, I want to be able to do this for somebody else. Thank you so much for sharing that today. We're going to ask one final question before we turn to the Q&A. So if anyone wants to go ahead and type their question into the chat box for us today. Lavinia, you've spoken about so many different aspects today, but we wanted to ask you, what is one personal passion that keeps you balanced outside of your everyday in the field of technology and analytics? It's definitely yoga and meditation. I feel like there's so much chaos, so much that keeps happening. Uh, if I if I wasn't relying on these kind of like, you know, these are like my go-to. This is like what keeps me sane. When I need to clear my head out, I really want to meditate for a couple of minutes. It really gets me calm. I feel like it unlocks my own personal potential to be able to go back and, you know, deal with things. Because uh, oftentimes I feel like when you don't have a set path, when you don't have clarity on things, that's okay. I think giving yourself also the space to say it's okay. You need to kind of ground your energy and yoga and meditation, I think, is, is a great way for me to be able to ground myself and go back and deal with it. And as simple as it sounds, I often say this, you know, you can start small, you know, just like the cupcake story, take do 30 seconds and then see if you can build upon it. There's so much power that comes in with the power of pause, the power of peace, the power of taking a couple of minutes just for yourself. So without fail, I try to every day find a couple of minutes for myself and be like, this is the thing that you need to do. You need to be able to give yourself some minutes to reorient and then go back and deal with all of the things that you need to deal with anyway. They're not going. <laughs> Great advice. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story. And we have our first uh, question from the audience. What is the biggest challenge you have faced when recruiting volunteers for your own organization? Yes, I think the biggest challenge is they don't stay forever. I wish they did. <laughs> But in terms of screening, I think you will oftentimes see sometimes volunteers are really enthusiastic at the beginning, uh, but then they kind of, the motivation disappears. So we kind of now have a system in place. We did have it at the first uh, month, but we kind of have drilled down a method of keeping and recruiting volunteers in an efficient way. We kind of have an MOU, a clear understanding of what's expected. We've also kind of designed our volunteer opportunities to give people a model that works best for them. We realize people are extremely efficient when we give them the tools to do things part-time, have fixed deadlines. That really, I think, gives people the space to be able to volunteer quickly. And then, yes, we've been super lucky and they don't stay forever, which we kind of miss. But sometimes and most oftentimes, we have a way of um, for them to be able to fill out would they be interested in volunteering again? Would they be interested in supporting for our day-to-day -day activities or maybe you know, just some of those main kind of events that we're hosting and if they want to recommend a person. So I think building that network in really helps. And then on the bright side, as we keep getting new volunteers, they come back with renewed energy. So it keeps <laughs> going. So it's just a process. And I feel like as we scale up, this is going to be um, a part of our organization. It isn't disappearing. The more systems we have in place, the easier it is to be able to deal with it, kind of create that opportunity and open that space for people to be able to experience joy. And do your volunteers have term limits or your board members have term limits? So our volunteers have term limits in terms of at the beginning when we're recruiting, they have an opportunity to do it minimum of four months because we feel like all the energy that's spent in recruiting and kind of training them, it would only make sense for us to do it for four months. They have an opportunity to renew it for a maximum of one year. The board members currently have a term of two years and then we kind of look back into if they're interested in supporting our organization further since we're still small and we're so grateful that our board is so supportive and would want to continue to be a part of it. Great. Okay, our next question. Um, are there any plans to expand the Boomer M outside of America as of now? Absolutely. It's This is global digital divide, and we're not just talking about digital divide in America, but as I said, we kind of broke down as to how do we start locally and then grow globally. So our kind of like 
digital sessions are open to audiences in different time zones, but in the future, we want to be able to have our pop-ups in different locations. We're, in fact, invited to present our research work uh, in Tokyo, Japan for March 2025 to be able to share our models. So we're really excited to be able to then scale up and bring this opportunity to all of those different markets that could benefit from the work we're doing. Now, you spoke a lot about um, building your community and different mentors. Would you be able to highlight some people or organizations or associations that you found that have been really helpful to follow or be involved with for our audience today? Absolutely. I think I'm involved in so many different networks that have shaped me into who I am today. So I'm always happy to make those you know, recommendations and connections to people. Because when I started, I really didn't know anybody. And then everyone told me, well, you have to know somebody in that group to be able to get started. And I said, okay, would they be interested in getting to know me? Would it hurt if I reached out and you know made that first call? But now I feel like I can make those connections for other people. But don't be afraid if you don't know people, you can get started. Uh, a lot of networks that, I've used, that I have personally loved being a part of were, are a lot of networking events that happened at UN. It's a lot of international space where I was able to learn how their model works, you know, while I was working, I realized how they use their volunteer model, how they ensure that volunteers kind of deliver what, what is it in for them. I think that is something you want to keep in mind. As you make this connection, think about how you can be useful for the other person, right? Why should they be friends with you? It's not in a way of, you know, kind of like mutually beneficial, but really think of them as humans. If they're going to give you their time and energy, find a way to thank them. Always find a way to be able to do that. There's a lot of... Um, entrepreneur kind of communities in New York City that I personally enjoyed going to. Those events have been really fascinating for me. Also, I'm involved with the Western Union Foundation, which is kind of like a global network of people that are involved in the social space. I think that has been a fantastic space for me to meet some of the global advisors that have kind of tried to do social ventures in different organizations, in different countries. And they're able to kind of give us, you know, some advice, things that they tried and what worked and what didn't work. Uh, and of course, Columbia Network is your absolute gem to begin with. I can thank so many people from the bottom of my heart that have shaped me into who I am and I wouldn't want to change that. So I think your biggest asset is you're, you were sitting on it is the <laughs> Columbia Network. Uh, and I definitely want to thank all my mentors who have gone above and beyond to shape us today. And if I had to like mention one person, definitely is um, Dr. Kitty K. Chan. She's mentored me and she's shaped me into who I am. It's she's a gem of a person, and I feel so fortunate that I'm able to learn so much from her. So really, utilize your Columbia network. You don't know how well connected they are. Also, all the people that you meet in you know terms of the industry you're most interested in. For me, it was nonprofit world. I was going to a lot of those nonprofit events, see how they run events, and then kind of see can I do it better, you know, or what is it that I really like that I would want to incorporate in my organization. That's going to be the biggest kind of like learning moment for you. Thank you. And I know you touched a little bit on your mentor and mentorship, which is actually a really great lead into one of our next questions, is what qualities should you look for a mentor in this technology and social change fields? So I think if you're really looking for to, to develop yourself in the social venture space, I would highly recommend that you go after mentors that will either give you the skill set or give you the advice that you need when you want to experience something in the uncertain scenarios. So I feel like, you know, when you go for a job, it's a lot kind of like a trajectory that a lot of people have experimented with. You can find a lot of information online, but you might not find a lot of information online for a social venture space that you're looking for. So to go after mentors who will allow you to help you navigate that uncertain space would be great. Go after people who have the expertise to be able to give you the tools that you need to be able to learn some of those things that you need, right? For instance, if you're in the technology space, it would be great to connect with a mentor who's in the tech space. They can tell you what works, what doesn't work, and then see how you would want to translate that into your industry that you're looking to build. And even if it's a different kind of like an industry, again, go back to like, who could be the experts that can give you the skills that you don't have, that you'd love to receive mentorship on, or those qualities. For instance, you know, patients, you know, find mentors are going to be supportive, will teach you the path you need. And I think this was kind of like the best advice I've received in my life. It was, I think, at the orientation um, day at Columbia, that anything teach you today tomorrow it could probably be redundant or old news but what we want you to learn is how to learn once you realize and figure out what works for you how you're able to learn as an individual 
you continue to find the resources you need. So, you know, when you think of mentors, think of people who will inspire you, who will help you to continue to learn. And that will, that is what's going to keep you going. That's great advice. Thank you. We have a question kind of about um, starting your own charity. How hard was it apply? How hard was it up to apply to the grants? And is there any insider tips you have for the audience today? The grants are very hard. I had no idea when I started the work. Uh, they're typically very competitive. Uh, and as I've and, and my biggest asset was kind of going back to a lot of grant applications where they were ready to take a meeting and give me feedback. Because I thought it's a great application. You know, we're great. It's a great mission. You love it. What happened after? And then sometimes it's, you know, it's either not a good fit or you're not big enough for them to be able to fund at that point. But what's really useful to kind of connect with who kind of is the grants manager at that foundation. Once you reach out to them, it's always super useful to have that conversation and let them know that this is the stage we're in. This is the kind of resources we're looking for. And it's useful to kind of build multi-year partnerships, right? So you could still be asking for the same resources, but when you kind of split it out over a period of time, you help build relations and it takes time. So the more relations you will build in this network, uh, the better off you are. At no point do I want to discourage you from making connections because if I was able to do it, you can do it. Just just keep going. Keep reaching out to people. Uh, and your grants managers are your kind of like your biggest asset because every grant is going to be kind of unique. But once you meet with them, they're more than happy to walk you through the process. And as you show them the impact that you've achieved, you will see it, it begins to get better. So definitely reach out. Do the networking that you need to do before applying for grants. Because you'll save yourself so much time. Sometimes they will tell you that we only want to fund kind of bigger organizations. A lot of times there are a lot of grants that will say it's invitation only. But I highly encourage you to still write an email and say, would, I would be curious to know how I could be on the roster for, you know, the invitation only list of organizations. And you'll be surprised. Sometimes they won't reply, but sometimes they do get back to you and say, well, well we'd love to hear your mission. Let's hear where you are. And let's see, maybe we could add you to that list eventually. So they're also all humans. Your mission is going to be your biggest asset. Take that story, let people know about it. And you'll be surprised how so many people will be curious to be like, okay, you know, we can actually consider you for the next cycle, send us a proposal. So it doesn't get easy, but you have to kind of still go after all of those opportunities without feeling the burden that each one's going to work out. It's a test of patience. It's not going to be a microwavable miracle, like I said. It's going to take time, but it works you eventually get on the other side. And then I think once you begin to win grants, you also know your niche. Not every grant is for you. There are gonna be specific grants that make a good fit, specific foundations where your story and their story align. And the more you lean onto it, the better off you will be in terms of your time, energy that goes in the blank. I think those are great insider tips, thank you. And that kind of um, falls into our next audience question, which is you mentioned, grants was kind of a challenging phase. Is there other challenges that you faced as a woman in the technology world, kind of navigating them when you were first getting started? So I think the only thing is sometimes you might feel the ratio is not that balanced, but other than that, I feel like you should see it as an opportunity. If you're the only person in the room, use it as an opportunity. You're the only person in the room. And if you're not gonna do it, who's gonna do it? And I think you'll be, sometimes I feel like the only thing that is stopping us from going after opportunities is ourselves. We're feeling all of this burden that it's not a good fit, maybe it won't work. If we just take that burden off and we begin to, you know, why don't we start talking about what if it does work, right? Can we start to imagine a lot more on what if we win the grant? What if we are the 1% that actually gets those opportunities? I think it became a life-changing kind of moment for me personally as a person and also for our organization, right? At the beginning when we were not kind of finding, you know, early successes, we were, we're doing all the paperwork, we're doing all the work, but why are we doing the grants? And some of these organizations are winning multi-year grants. And I think when we shifted from why we're now winning to an abundance mindset, that we just have to find the right foundations to fund us. Somebody is going to fund us, somebody is going to give us the seed grant. I think it changed the way in which we were pursuing these opportunities and the way we went and pitched ourselves that, yes, we don't have a whole lot of, you know, bigger organization kind of situations, but we're, we're looking to grow. How can we get there? Can you give us tips, advice, and any feedback is positive feedback for a smaller organization. So I think definitely those were the people that then kind of, you know, instead of really seeing them as people I want to go after to give me a grant, I started to include them in the 
process of, okay, this is my organization, but this is no longer my organization. This is our organization. <laughs> Where do you see us, you know, taking this to the next step? How can I bring this to a different state? We have all these volunteers. We have all this work. How do we scale up? I started asking and inviting people into that conversation. And I think that's when I started to see the success. When people felt like, okay, I see where you're coming from. It's not typical for a lot of people to come ask us because, you know, oftentimes they're just getting questions. Can you give us the grant? And they're like, no, it's kind of decided. You have to be on the list. But when you start to invite people into the conversation, they started giving me actual solutions to be able to win those grants. They said, well, a partnership could be great. If you're a smaller organization, you know, think of doing joint applications. Go for kind of joint applications where somebody else can then be the bigger organization that says they've, you know, been in the industry for 50 years and you're a smaller organization that will partner with them on this specific program and that will help you kind of win the grant. And that's true, you know, and, and then you have experience working with grants and then you become the organization that can then begin to apply independently. So I think those were all kind of key learning moments for me. And I feel like I didn't find a lot of that advice online. A lot of people don't talk about this. They don't talk about that grants are going to be hard, but these are all the ways in which you could go after them and it actually works. So definitely use this as an opportunity to go after them, find a partner and really go after and ask them, can, how can I how can I really make it to that list? They're going to be the only people that can give you the answer. Nobody else. Nobody else can give you the magic number for it. I think that's great advice to not panic and change your organization a million times, but to change your mindset. And maybe that's how you start to work through it because I, I'm sure everyone worries about, you know, do they have the right organizational mission? So that's great advice. And you're right, it is hard. And there's not a lot of um, people talking about the challenges and the day-to-day -day work and, and the effort. So we really appreciate all of your insider tips and tricks today. Um, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us today, Lavinia, and asking and answering all of the audience questions. Um, I'd like to thank our She Open the Door Committee and CAA for helping to make today's conversation a success. Um, for those in the audience, uh, we hope that you will consider volunteering with the CAA to help fellow alumni and students involved in meaningful initiatives like this. And as Lavinia said, the Columbia Network is a great network to be a part of to find other people that are interested in your passions and missions. Um, our next She Open the Door event will be November 22nd, again at 12 o'clock p.m. And on the slide, you'll see um, our website for She Open the Door for more information about upcoming events. Um, and we also have some events happening outside of the New York City area. And then if you'd like to connect with Lavinia, her information is there. And with that, thank you, Lavinia, for such a great conversation today. And we hope everyone has a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you to She Opened the Door Committee and everybody back in organizing this. I think it's a wonderful resource, and I'm so grateful to the Columbia community. Personally, I think I've grown so much as, as a person when I look back, so definitely so grateful, and in any ways I could be uh, helpful. If anybody needs any advice, I'm always open to be there, and really don't be afraid, because I always respond, because I know I've been there. I've, I've reached out to so many people. So really, don't be afraid. I think there's nothing to lose. You only gain from going after opportunities in life. So keep going, keep, and, and you know, you'll actually be surprised. Sometimes I could never go back and be like, oh, this is everything I'm going to do in my life. It <laughs> turned out even better, but it really just needed me to find that courage uh, on days I wasn't sure. So you can find that courage. You can do it too. Uh, and I'm so grateful that I get to share this with all of you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.